Hello everyone, my name is Manon Lendenen. I'm co-organizer of the volunteer-based IoT SenseMakers community, where we share knowledge, hands-on experience and human networks. I also work at the Dutch police. And although many think that our job is to catch criminals, it's only a means to an end. Our main purpose is to protect our constitutional values. And it is in this context that I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on IoT and a connected society. People talk about the Internet of Things, but it might be better to talk about the Internet of Everything. Objects, beings, human beings, uh, the whole environment is being equipped with sensors and communications. For example, in the context of smart cities, sensing contributes to more livability. A great example are the smart bins. They measure themselves how full they are, and when necessary, they schedule themselves on the route of the garbage truck. This leads to less CO2 emission, and also less junk alongside the containers. And what about those convenient smart consumer products? Isn't it easy that I can talk to my oven when preparing the food? This poses, however, a great threat in the sense of cybercrime, identity theft, and data abuse. Because little or no security is implemented. Uh, who would buy a smart brush for over 400 euros? To explain the um, consequences of the smart society, I would like to introduce this smart office chair as a simplified example. Because what does a chair need to make it smart and to what purpose? Let's consider this eight-story office building in The Hague uh, with flex places where people can work. To prevent people from wandering around on all eight floors, it would be easy to have a chair uh, communicating if it's available or not. Uh, so we need a location uh, where it's based in the building and for example a pressure sensor uh, to check if someone is sitting on it or not. But what if I'm standing up or uh, you know we Dutch when we go on holiday we get up early in the morning to go down to the pool and put our towels on the chairs next to it to reserve them for later use. The same will happen in the office. We'll put our bags on the chair uh, and claim them for the whole day. So that's why often a combination of sensors is used uh, and intelligence. You could, for example, add a temperature sensor to check if it's a live weight or dead weight on the chair. The recipe uh, giving meaning to the combined sensor values and the resulting status uh, is what we call an algorithm. But if you think this really true, you might notice that it's impossible uh, to make a chair smart only based on sensing. There are always assumptions, norms or opinions involved. Because what is the definition of available? Some companies might say you can leave your chair unattended for 30 minutes to go to the restroom or grab a coffee. While others let you, let you attend a three hour meeting while still keeping it occupied for you. My point is that alternative realities arise. Every object gets a digital twin. We have the physical chair and the virtual one, and they can differ. The company having the system as a filter will say that the chair was occupied at a certain time, while the person sitting next to, to it at the next desk will see it empty. It's the algorithm based on data, the assumptions, norms, that decides what we see. So now not only do we have information bubbles online on the internet, they also arise in the physical world. And as I said, this is only a simple example to play, explain the workings. But you can imagine it's very important to understand these phenomena. For example, for the police, when we want to check an alibi. What's also changed is where uh, before IoT was ma mainly used for maintenance or uh, simulation purposes, uh, the digital twin now determines the behavior of the in the physical world. The digital twin of the bin determines the route of the garbage truck. The digital twin of a glucose meter uh, determines how much insulin a pump delivers. And the same uh, when on autopilot, the digital twin of a car, plane, or boat uh, determines its behavior. 
as these objects get more sensors, they become context aware. And in many cases, we want this, uh, not only for convenience, uh, but we need uh, smart health solutions to keep our health system affordable. And also for someone uh, suffering from diabetics, uh, a smart portable insulin pump can really improve the quality of life. But it also means that more and more uh, data is collected. And even if systems are not aimed at it, like air quality sensors, they still collect data about our behavior. So where until recently, uh, our behavior was mostly monitored uh, online or by our phone, now the whole environment is collecting data about our behavior. And this has a huge impact, yeah. regardless even of cyber security aspects, uh, it really impacts our life, uh, yes. especially because it's becoming increasingly invisible. The sensors and the intelligence gets more and more integrated. I see two accelerators in this domain. The first is coalition, uh, the international uh, standard, uh, the qualification of the uh, daily life. This is an international standard which uh, makes it possible to measure and qualify uh, behavior. When I touch my right ear, it gets assigned a different number from when I touch uh, my left ear. And the other is the classification of sound, combined with the increased uh, amount of microphones uh, being implemented in objects around us. For those who uh, eat Pringles, they know if you open the Pringles bottom uh, box, it has this typical sound, plop. This sound has been classified. So when you're sitting on the couch, watching the television, opening up your Pringles, the objects around you recognize this sound and instantly can serve you an ad for dipping sauce on your smart TV. To explain where this is leading in our society, I would like to share with you a part of this wonderful Effective Things video. Uh, you can find it on uh, Vimeo. I recommend you uh, look it up. Of course, adding more sensors will improve the decision making, as will AI. A lot is going on in the field of emotion recognition, neurosensing, um, to know more about our status at a certain moment. But while adding more sensors, um, you also add more uh, incorporated assumptions. And the last point I want to make is that is, this is really uh, impacting our being. Because who would we be listening to the radio otherwise? And will we in the future hide our feelings in our own home, uh, afraid of what objects might conclude from it and do? Or worse, Will those conclusions about our behavior be shared with others to be combined for profiling 
deciding what kind of products, services, information we get and for what price or not even getting them offered. Or targeting and manipulating us with fake news uh, at our most vulnerable uh, moments. So while in the offline world we're trying to protect the vulnerable and eradicate exclusion and discrimination through the digitalization, it's hitting back at us in the weirdest ways. And if you understand how it works, you can use it uh, to get cheap discounts, um, cheap uh, plane tickets, discounts, uh, or to manipulate others uh, like Cambridge Analytica did during the Brexit and the American elections. But those who don't will become more vulnerable. And even if you do understand it, it's hard, if not impossible, to protect yourself from the profiling and targeting when uh, this is completely ubiquitous in our environment. So with this talk, I wanted to share with you that with our society being permeated uh, with sensors uh, collecting data about our behavior is becoming increasingly opaque uh, how this data contributes to profiling leading next to the good things to exclusion discrimination undermining of our, our constitutional values and affecting us in our innermost being together with uh, ministries uh, cities uh, public institutions the Dutch police is helping to create safeguards uh, to protect our digital rights and our constitutional values. For example, by creating a de decentralized public independent trust infrastructure. But you can also do something. A lot of you work in tech. So please promote privacy and security by default. Uh, create an awareness of its importance for our own autonomy. And if you're designing smart systems, uh, ask yourself, what data do I really need? Why am I collect collecting this data? Do I even need tech? Because what's the problem? Um, and test it. Test your smart products in every possible way, in every possible context. Because to conclude my talk and to emphasize this importance of testing and diversity in tech, I want to finish with a, a video of uh, Mr. Avigbo that went viral a few years ago. And although it's not a connected product, it was designed to be smart. Okay, Noel, you try it. One to your hand. Two black. Two black. Yeah. So what come, again. Oh, come again, come again, Sasha. Hello. Ah, you too back over with. Yeah, what I have to do to get 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 <laughs> man, the black man in fight down all over, all over, all over. So thank you for listening to my some of my thoughts on IoT and the connected society. I hope you will share yours, your insights, uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna. Thank you, Manon. And uh, I guess we'll look through. I don't know if anyone has questions out loud or questions in the comments. Uh, I really liked your point where you're getting at. Hey, you work in tech. Let's try and push for privacy by default, but it's a really important message that needs to get out there. So thank you. Yeah, I'm really proud of people at Google and other companies who are putting their jobs on the line uh, just to make that point. That's a good point. Yeah.
because it's the only way uh, we can change it bottom up. So thank you. So it looks like at this stage, does anyone have any questions in the comments? Doesn't look like it. 